to be a short lecture because I should have started at 2 o'clock. At 4 o'clock, I, I should be at some other, the other end of the city, also lecturing at the Kufianan International Peacekeeping Training Center. Um, and I'm one of many sites. Uh, as you were told, I did last thing that I did to a higher level, I did more into, I delved more into political science or political economy. Um, then from Russia, I taught here a little and then came to the United States. Uh, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy in Boston, met for that to be precise. Uh, so, well, there I took more interest in conflict and uh, counter violent extremism. So, last year when I was in Canada, when I was being introduced to the students, uh, the professors, I was introduced as someone who teaches terrorism. I'm sorry, I don't teach terrorism. <laughs> I teach or I talk about terror, terrorism. So, uh, just a little household kind of caveats. Number one, I got an accent, a bad one as such, speaking American English. Mm -hmm. So, if you don't understand me, my pronunciations are not up to your standards, please stop me. It's not my making. I, I, got, I, I got an accent. I can't say water, I will say water. <laughs> so try and understand me. Number two, I'm not a walking encyclopedia. I say something you don't agree, stop me, let's argue, let's, let's come to some kind of understanding as to where I'm coming from, where you're coming from. Finally, I don't have answers to it, many of the things that you may want to know, and who I'll try and answer your questions anyway, somehow. As I said, my name is Vladimir. Uh, and Julian So, um, the professor of international relations, and uh, we'll go from today. We're going to talk about culture and development. Culture and development. Culture and development. There is the debate out there whether culture has anything to do with development at all. And this debate has gone on for a number of years. We're still debating. Has culture anything to do with development? Does development need to revert to or re 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 take recourse to culture before development has a meeting? And I tell you, in the development discourse, that is what is going on very seriously today. Why is it so? First and foremost, let's look at what is culture? What is development? Do they have any confluence? And then we see whether culture has anything to do with development. That's where I want to start. What is culture? Can we, can we speculate? When I say culture, yes? Um, a set of attitudes, beliefs, and actions associated with a group of groups of people. Beautiful, beautiful. Beautiful. I mean, there's no apt description more than you have given. Take a I, I thought you were reading from a dictionary. Very apt. Right. Attitudes, beliefs, your worldview, how you look at the world, and, and, and it, it sets your, your, your worldview and the way you behave, and your way of understanding phenomena. So it's a very good apt description. You know, and so we, when you talk about culture, we have different cultures. And not only the beliefs, you can have the aquaculture, whatever culture. That's all we're talking about. We're talking about a people, and that's a very apt description. Now, what is development? What is development? Why do you say? It? Oh, um, I think it is like the the process of building something, I would have said that. I don't, it, building, in the process of building communities. Okay, yes, also building communities. Uh, development is, oh, it's like enhancement or uh, change for the better. Beautiful, enhancement of what? Change, the two words we use are very, very apt. Enhancement, change, yes? From one level of life and living, listen carefully, change, enhancement of one level of life to a higher one. All right? Always it must be, a, okay, you might be developing downwards, but we don't care about that. We should be caring about enhancement of your, I went to Cuba 
And um, as a certain thing, we wanted to know how the Cubans believe in their revolution and whatnot. We went to some village. And the guy was so proud of his life. I've never seen the, the pride in the man. That look, I'm very old. And I knew it before Fidel came. But now look, I'm in a brick house. Brick house. Okay? It's gotten a brick house. Formerly it was the the roof was made of uh, um, used uh, what do you call it? straws from sugar cane. Now he's in a brick house. Roof with corrugated aluminum sheets. And and he's proud. That is the change I'm talking about. That the man has developed. His children now go to school. He doesn't pay anything though. But whatever it is, whatever it is, he can see a change in his life and living. His life. Now let's put the two things together. One, my attitudes, norms, beliefs. So my next question is, if development is change and enhancement for the better, does it have anything to do with, would it change my beliefs and norms and what, so is it possible? Do, do they have a relationship or change? Do they have the relationship and in which way do they have that relationship? Yes. I think it can be bi-directional. I think you can develop culture and I think culture can be, you can have a culture of development. Yes, culture of development. Very good. We'll come to that. But that is very, very important. The culture of development and development of culture. Let me go back and I'll come back to you. I think it also depends on the way in which you're developing. Like if we're using like the European ideal of development, then that may change the culture. Beautiful thing over there. So you see that, like you said, it was by influential, kind of. All right? And so my development can change my culture. And my culture may influence the type of development I have. Come before I go on the episode. Yeah. I just have a, I guess, a historical example in mm -hmm. that if you look at like Western civilization and how it started in the United States and one of the justifications that a lot of the colonies had to, you know, overthrow and you know kill all the Indians that they weren't really utilizing the land and developing the land the way that they thought they should. So they kind of utilized that type of like framework in order to like I guess do their style. So we'll come to a point where because of globalization, some superior cultures are influencing other cultures. Yeah. Right. Superior cultures influence cultural people call it cultural assimilation. Others call it cultural imperialism. Yes. So what made you say it's superior? Like what? I think something that I I, I keep hearing uh, here in Ghana is that um, they feel as if the people who colonized um, Africa and who took slaves, and they were somehow like above them, so they were superior in some way. So when you say superior, what do you mean? Because to me, it's like there's clearly a lack of morale in the culture in which. Um, uh, colonize this country. You have brought two arguments over here. The question of superiority in terms of morality. There are two different, you can't mix the two together. If I meet you, and I know something I'm bigger than you, and I give you a blow and you fall now, I'm superior. The question of morality doesn't come in over here. So that they came for the slaves is a moral question. That they were able to take the slaves is a, is a kind of uh, relationship, one higher than the other, simple. They came with the guns, they had money, they had rum, they would give the rum to the chiefs, rum, or a drink, yeah. all right? And the chief loved the, the rum. Jamaican rum, whatever it is they came for. I know the chief said, oh, uh, the chief will even give them people to go into the internet to go and catch the slaves. That's superiority. I mean, that, that, that's the superiority I'm talking about. It's like Ghana playing Brazil. Already the mentality is that Brazil is better. Okay, in terms of samba, soccer, and that kind of thing. But we'll do our best. We'll play them before, we'll beat them before in a friendly game in London. But then, okay, or Ghana going to war with the United States of America. Come on, give me a break. The term of superiority will come in. Not in terms of morality, but the term superiority, we need to accept that as, as a, a normative thing that allowed them. Other than that, look. Some of our people were very strong. I, when I talk about the slave trade, I said, look, it is only the most viral, the strong, the people who have what it takes to, to withstand torture that were able to cross the 10,000 kilometers without clothes, packed like sardines. 
right? You may visit some of the slave areas and you really see how we are a strong people with resilience to be able to withstand. All right? So uh, it, there are two different arguments. But let's come back to our question of culture and development. Now, let me go back to where I started from culture and development. First, the economists are battling whether to use culture as a variable. But before we do that, coming back to the basic question of what is culture and what is development, there are five basic things when you want to talk about a people's development, even within culture. And that is first and foremost, culture is, does not hang in the air, and development does, does not hang in the air either. First, your culture and your development will be determined by your geography. Whether you like it or not. If I, I, was, I was born in uh, Mexico some 5,000 years ago in the Aztec Kingdom, all right? That is where I was born, and the environment around me will determine a lot of things. So first is geography. The next is you came to meet something, so it's your history. History determines your culture, your development. Your history, what was handed over to you, is what it can be oral tradition. This is how we do it. This is not how we do it. When I was young, I remember very well in the night, we young boys, you know, you work it up at the coast. But our parents told us that you don't do that in the night. The ancestors don't like that. Oh, professor, now, but I, I still remember those things. And at that time, my children are doing that in the in the evening. I try to. To, to scare them by saying the ancestors don't like this. You wake them up. <laughs> you, you, you wake them up. So your geography, your history creates condition for. Now, your geography has what we call the ecology. What God has given within the geographical space? What is on the earth? What is the soil good for, for sorghum or is the soil good for cocoa? You don't plant cocoa in the US. But I, but I plant it here. And that is the basis of my economy. So this thing, and this is move in concept. You know, it's like not that they are compartmentalized, your geography alone gives you this. They move in concept. So your geography, your history, your ecology, put together, you build a certain economy. And then all these things will be shaped by politics. National and international. These are the things that determine the boundaries of your culture and your development. You say Iranian culture, fine, they got it from their geography, from their history, from their ecology. They built a certain type of economy. But today, the international system and the national kind of system is giving them a certain kind of development. Without these things, you don't have anything like a, a conundrum of culture and development. So you would see that, for example, Samuel Huntington, in one of his books, was talking about development. Uh, when he was talking about these, Clash of civilizations, right? Can you say the name one more time? Come again? Can you say the name one more time of the author? Samuel Huntington. Uh, Huntington, Samuel. I mean, you must know him from his very famous book, The Clash of Civilizations. Mm -hmm. The clash. He's talking about, he predicted in 1998 um, that the end of the Cold War was now going to shift from east west confrontation, which is dead now, to a north south confrontation one, and the second confrontation is more deadly, and that is a clash of civilization. So that's the title of the book. And he predicted a clash between Islam and Western civilization. He said the Judeo Christian culture is going to clash with civilizations that are not receptive. So what is happening now, the man is a prophet. Between ISIS, yes. He said, great book, get that book, 
by it. It's, it came in, 19, in the year 2000. And in 1998, when he wrote it as an article, I was in the US, he got a lot of bombardment for his fellow professors. That is a doomsday prophet. And that doomsday has come. But when he was writing this, we had no ISIS, no Al Qaeda, nothing. All right? But now it's clear. But his prophecy was clear. When. Look, I was talking about the colony. Try and plant cocoa in the US and force the people to plant cocoa. It's a clash. It wouldn't do well. You need to create the, the ecology of Ghana or West Africa in the US. Maybe because you may be able to do it, but then that is the clash. So if Judeo Christian uh, capitalist form of how to form societies and build societies, you go to Iraq, like Bush said, the Bush doctrine, that they were going to take up, take away Saddam Hussein and make Iran, sorry, Iraq, the beacon of democracy. The kind of democracy are you talking about? When the people have lived hundreds of thousands of years and all they know is theocracy. That once somebody steals something, his hand is chopped off. You see the second time, the second hand is chopped off. That is what they are living with. And you bring something unreceptive to them. It's a clash of civilization. Mm -hmm. That is the clash he was talking about. And it is happening today, isn't it? Yeah. That is the clash. So in culture and development, if you don't respect the people's upbringing, their culture, their beliefs and whatnot, and keep changing it to conform to these five elements, there's no way you will succeed in changing their culture. Mm -hmm. But let me assure you that culture is not static. Absolutely. Culture is not static. My brother says he's a musician. Beautiful. Now see what is happening throughout the world. <laughs> the last time I was in Libya, and uh, I saw Libyans uh, rapping in the Arabic language. So my God. Rap has taken over the whole world. In my country, they sing in my local dialect, but they are rapping. But rap, basically, it's an American culture. Started from America, right? So culture does not stay static. There is cultural assimilation. And it is only when that culture is receptive to the other culture that you are able to. So all the kinds of development we have, in, we must respect culture in these dimensions and development in these dimensions. Huntington, Huntington talks about how Ghana, my country, it is in his book, my country and Malaysia, at the time we got independence in 1960, right, we had basically the same level of development, the same level of per capita income, the same level of everything. He compared the notes and said, oh, look at these people. But 30 years later, we are nowhere near Malaysia. 30 years later, in the 1990s, when Ghana was really under debt and there was nothing over here, it's because of the different cultural, maybe cultural atmosphere that we had. It's our attitude to work. He was saying that the Malaysian had this uh, Confucian attitude to work. You know, the type of religion they were, they are used to over there. Hard work, belief in oneself, belief that I can do spirit, I have to excel. But we, not that we are lazy, but that not how the British trained us over here. <laughs> and that's not how our, our ancestors also taught us to respect elders and you know you don't have to challenge the elder whatever the elder says is correct. I mean you don't have to challenge. You have no math. When you know when your elders speak, they've spoken. So excuse me when they tell you very stupid thing, you take it. But the Malaysians moved away from that and they were challenging the elders. They said the youth, our future is ours, we can do it. And they exacted from every individual the potential in the individual. We were waiting for our government to bring the goods. And we had our arms inside our hands. So Huntington was talking about these things, even when they are equal, how you use them is also important. And culture is receptive if it can follow these five. Of course, these things are not in Huntington's book, but anytime you are reading culture and development, you will realize that this, these are the important things. There is a book I'll refer you to if you got it by. It. I mean, they are on the streets in Ghana. Those guys who come by their car and say, some of them are holding that book. I bought mine on the street in Ghana. He's a very good writer on political economy. 
all right? And he has a book called How Nations Fail. If you want to understand culture and development, get that book. How Nations Fail. How nations fail. A C E M O G L E. How nations fail. Why? Sorry, not how. Why nations fail. And he's giving concrete examples in the US where New Mexico and Mexico, all right, along the border, two towns which were separated by, I forgot the names of the towns, and the development, the one on the US side. And the development of the oh, one. Okay. I think so. I think so. Warriors. Warriors. I think so. Well, you check the one. I, I forgot. But I was interested in how meticulously he was able to delve into the culture of the Mexicans or the Mexican culture, which was still with the people on the Mexican side. But when the US culture caught up with the people on the US side and the different type of development that we see. Again, there was this Aztec culture about the Papayanis and the uh, Antiquos, even within the historical setup in when the Spaniards came and conquered the place, how the Aztec Empire, even though it died, how the development went, and the same people had conquered a group of people also within the Antiquinos, and how their development also was different. So you ask yourself, why is development different from any part of the world? And then you come back to this. The geography, the history, the ecology, the economy, and the politics. I tell you, these days, one and the other are changing. But luckily, we have Porter. Uh, no, not Harry Potter. Harry Potter, he said. <laughs> Michael. This Michael. Uh, Porter died, uh, his, uh, Diamond Theory. Water is now giving us something to think about. He's claiming, yes, talk of culture. It's real, it's historical, it is natural, natural. But then, today, something is changing all kinds of cultural and developmental issues. What is that you can guess? Something is changing, we are all going, we are all at the center. Ghana can develop more than the US or US more than the Chinese because of something. Yes, yes, I will agree to that, but there is a one word that encompasses all there. Globalization. 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 Right. It's changing the equation. Globalization is science and technology induced. And wheeled around the world by trade and finance. And so, if you can buy the idea of science and technology and put your economy on the basis of science and technology, and you begin to want to trade more, look at China. Come on, give me a break. Today, do you guys know about Martel? Martel. Oh, oh making fat. Where is it now? China. China. Why did it close down in the US? Money. Cheap labor. Cheap labor. Economics. Globalization. So we, we produce in China and export them as Chinese export, but then the whole globe gets this. <laughs> and it's not only that. Several other companies are moving and looking for, and that is what is called globalization. So finally, Porter is telling us that, yes, we can study all these, but there is a certain, uh, uh, a certain phenomenon going on. That is going to change all that. And we are going to have what we call the global culture. Global culture, irrespective. Uh, some of us are saying it's true, but still, globalization has its own antinomies. And it will take a while. Uh, the clash of civilization is making it impossible for globalization to reach everywhere at the same time, same whatever it is, you know, it's, it's terrible. Uh, but then, yes, he's right. Because of globalization, we can Ghana can decide not to not to not to deal in cocoa anymore, right? But to have a certain kind of silicon valley. Uh, we don't have silicon over here, so we we'll call it Volta Valley, all right? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, maybe Silicon Valley will stop production and produce from Ghana. Check your iPhones. How many of you have iPhones? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Almost all. Almost everybody, right? 
So you can when you open the bag, do you see the cover? It is written over there. What is that? What is written? Chicago Technology. China. Made in China. Thank you. Right. So this is where I end. I need to be rushing back, but then if you can take some few questions. But basically, when you talk about um, culture and development, this is the thing. So when you go to a place and the culture does not allow them to, you know, some, there are some, when we say backward, people say, what do you mean by it? There are some, what, backward because they draw development back. For example, until quite recently in my country, we still had uh, female circumcision. And then we had to fight to get rid of that. We have some other beliefs. Uh, when, when, uh, uh, or we have this widowhood rights, which we have fought against. When a man dies, the woman is locked with the cops in, in a room overnight. Oh, yes. Was it what? That is the culture of the people. That is the belief of the people. That it must be done. If you don't do it, your husband will come and take you away. Or if you are the one who poisoned him to, before the close of the, the daybreak, you also would have died. Kind of a belief. Um, um, you don't go to the riverside on a certain day because the gods will come to come and drink from the river that day. So if, if there is a day when we must build a bridge over the river, we can go to the river, sort of, kind of. We had all these negative kind of, which are existing in some other cultures outside now. So but that's the belief of the people. Uh, globalization will one day take away all these, and development will be allowed one way or the other. Um, so you said briefly that because and with globalization, it's easier for certain countries, for example, Ghana, to not really deal with the corporation of, of like cocoa, for example. Do you think it's that easy for like certain countries not to participate in certain economic like economic relationships with other countries, considering that superpowers have their influences in other countries like yeah. the United States? Is it easy for them to just say, you know what, I don't want to have absolutely. absolutely, it's not absolutely, it's not easy. Absolutely, you're right. But then I give as a as a weird example. For example, I was okay. just talking that because of globalization, Ghana's main state for our economy is cocoa, mm -hmm. spice with gold, diamond, blah 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 blah. But supposing Ghana, using globalization as an example, suppose, supposing all of us in Ghana believes that turning our Volta basin into a silicon basin mm -hmm. and dealing in, especially if we have coal here. Yeah. Why do we bother ourselves cult cultivating cocoa? The process is taking a long time. Gestation period, long, long gestation period of cocoa to produce, and you know, you know, you know. So I was only giving us an example, which is not easy to. But then, the possibility of what I'm saying is that the probability is near, maybe, but the possibility that one day, I go to China, they decide to forgo whatever it is and then concentrate on something, and they go for it, and and the world is going that way. The world is going the way where you believe, because right now we have really decided not to sell our cocoa beans to the West the way we are selling anymore. We want to turn them into other products. All right? We now have, we extract oil from cocoa, from it from cocoa, the powder, um, what else? A lot of things. In fact, the husks, we don't throw them away anymore. When we send them raw, somebody gets all these things, you know, added value. And they even didn't know the use of the husks. We have found that is the base for smooth skin here in the country. Uh, a friend of mine has, I didn't, know I, have, I didn't know I would touch on this. My father used to have something from cocoa and from palm kernel. Uh, it's very good for removing stretch marks. Yes? And it was done indigenously. Now an industrialist has taken it and has made it into nice oil. And it's, 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 it's being bought left and right. It's exported. You know, stretch marks, any other skin diseases, or, you know, when especially women give birth, stretch marks come around. And that's what my father was using in curing them. Now it has been properly industrialized. Nice oil, perfume. And it's going first, but the Japanese buy them like anything. You know, dandruff and whatnot. You just add um, shea butter, and they are gone. Mm -hmm. Supposing this is going to give us more foreign exchange, uh, what the hell would I worry myself going to plant cocoa, which will take five, ten years before it starts producing? You know, so that kind of thing. Gotcha. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other? Yes. Uh, how do you see? 
the implementation. So Hunting also wrote, you know, the third wave of democracy, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And how do you see uh, the implementation of Western democracy on Ghana's culture? Because I like what you said about how you can't ignore culture when implementing uh, democracy. Okay, okay, very good. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy you mentioned Western democracy, and even in the Western democracy, there's nothing like Western democracy. Yeah. No two democracies are the same. The way you elect your president, for example, for me, is undemocratic. Then, British, you only need to be the head of your party, yeah. and if you win your constituency, once you are the head of your party, you become my prime minister. Who told you I like you? <laughs> So, no democracies are the same, but there are some basic principles of democracy, all right, which each country will have to uh, in, in, uh, incorporate, and then based on your culture, your democratic culture, your culture comes from all these. Now, take Mali, for example. Historically, Malian democracy is based on who is who. The Ghana, Songhai, Mali empires, if you have read about those empires, you see that they believe in the strong man yeah. Yes. And even today, when you come as the prime minister or the president, and they don't see you issuing degrees, they say you are a weak person. And then you sit down talking to me about Western democracy. So their society will grow only when they have a strong man. <laughs> That's when we need to talk about the clash of civilizations. Democracy is brewed only in the historical part of a people. Democracy is not an event that if you put on your mind, get set, ready, go, and then people make it 10 seconds, 9 seconds, and say you breasted the thing, you've reached democracy. Democracy is a process. So gradually, what is bad for the people, the people say we don't like it. It's changed, it's changed. Democracy, America hasn't reached democracy yet. You are still building, you don't like this, you add and subtract amendments and whatnot. So democracy is a process. So to supplant or to import some so-called Western democracy on it, that's the mistake we are making. People go to war, soon after the war, you, you line them up for the ballot, from bullet to ballot, it doesn't work. Democracy is a process. You begin gradually to build the institutions. People believe in the institutions. The institutional governance is the best in democracy. When the institutions of state are the ones governing, not the head of state who says they have been voted for. Now that the rigging is everywhere, including American rigging, then the people we elect are not the correct people. But the institutions of state, and that is where I always say that in democracy, institutions matter more. That the people will put there. Because the remit of the constitution given to the institutions will dictate how the society is run. The end of your question means that how do we import that? We are not importing. We are all coming to one center. If you watch out, whether Russia or China, there are some basic tenets of democracy everybody is struggling to have. That is positive. Because you say, let me give you a weird example and you may not like me. You say something like gay right, gay and lesbian and bisexual rights. Huh? America is now, or the West, is now, is their rights? Is their rights? They are right. That's what they feel. It's their rights. Go and say this in Saudi Arabia. They will lynch you, burn you to ashes. But it may come a time when they have genera a new generation, some thousand years, two thousand, we don't know. So to go to Saudi Arabia and say there is no democracy because lesbians and gays don't have rights, you are still wrong. That's why I say democracy is a process. Never, never an event. Um, so I got a follow-up question. So how do you see in a lot of West Africa and Africa in general, uh, ethnicity has played a large role in the process and the development and yeah. consolidation of yeah. democracy. Yeah. So how do you see ethnicity in Ghana playing a role in Ghana's, I wouldn't say democratic success, but its efficiency in that process of democratic success? People are talking about democratic success in Ghana. This can be derailed by fourth lines in our democratic dispensation. Listen very carefully. Fourth lines. In every democracy, there are fourth lines. If you don't know how to navigate those fourth lines very well, it's derailed. Sierra Leone, Liberia, they're all examples. Ethnicity is a bad canker. It's a cancer that needs to be cured. But democracy, the way we have defined it, 
majority will listen. So people are rush, racing to the bottom where <coughs> numbers count, all right? So you play the ethnic card. So tomorrow, if the other two, three ethnic people also get together against you, and the typical example is Kenya, where democracy will continually pick up. Why? Because the Kikuyus yes. are 33% of the population, and they rely on them. They tell you all Kikuyus must go to Kikuyu to power. The Luos are only 30%. They will never come to power. Why? Because the Kikuyus have married themselves to the Kalinjis, who are 12%. And since the Western democracy says 50% plus one vote means democracy, the Kikuyus always want to obey that thing for the West to tell them, you have a democracy. Wrong. The fault lines have not been navigated. The Luos will never accept that, and they will always play the negative card. And what happens? Wars all the time. So you see how I always talk about democracy not quantitative. Just mm -hmm. yes, allow the people to build their institutions and make sure that the people understand their institutions. Mm -hmm. And then you transform the society. Democracy that does not transform society and lives in the legacy of ethnicity, clientelism. Ethnicity brings clientelism. You build a clientele. You build the roads to the place rather than the other people who didn't vote for you. We have it in Ghana. And it's very dangerous. I've told Benny and the Everest will always vote 99% for the NDC. The Ashantis will always vote 99% for the NPP. And it's dangerous. Very dangerous. But that's one I think I can fly. Um, then what do you think America should do going forward in the and all the other countries? Yes. I read some articles about this. Uh, this the, the, the war on terror is being fought wrongly. We still fight terror with geopolitics in mind. Wrong. Still Cold War metrics, Cold War thinking, Cold War calculus, Cold War lenses. When the problem started in Iraq, the Americans were happy. Why? Because they called them pro-democracy forces wanting to come and, you know, to oust uh, uh, Assad, whom Americans hate. So it was in the interest of America that that chaos went on in Syria. And I bet you, if you Google, you will see it. Uh, John Kerry, in whose office I worked in 1990, was it seven or so when he wanted to become it? I, I went as a volunteer, I liked him. But that's what I'm going to tell you, make me not like him anymore. In London, when we went to talk about the Syrian question, he pledged hundred million dollars for the rebels. Yes, this is true. And they call them pro-democracy forces. The same thing he did, 60 million dollars for the so-called pro-democracy forces in Libya. And the so-called pro-democracy forces fought and fought and fought, ousted Gaddafi, and what happened? The first democracy tenet they showed was to kill an American ambassador. So you see, when we are fighting the war on terror, let us have a proper one definition for the terrorists and fight with one fist. So whether it is Russian or American or whatnot, we are fighting the terrorists. And terrorism is what? The illegal use of force perpetrated by non-state actors against innocent persons for the perpetration of a certain political goal. That's terrorism. So even if the government of the day is illegitimate, those forces have no right to use that force against the regime, against innocent people. So all of us in the world. So on and on and on, America played that negative role until ISIS was formed. ISIS came out of the ashes of Iraq. And then when ISIS was formed, America didn't know whom to support. So they picked and chose whom they were supporting. One group they supported, Turkey did not like that group, and that kind of thing. Then the Russians also felt that they must support their mind, Assad. So the war on terror was wrong. So to fight terrorism, if you don't move as like the United Nations or whatever it's like, Russia, China, all fighting the ISIS together, they would have been gone long time. Today we, we think, look, I think, I don't know whether you, you saw the book before, yeah. before yes, yeah. I have several other books on ISIS, because I'm writing my own book about terrorism, you know. And until the world fights terrorism with one fist, we are going to create more terrorists. Now, Zakari and his people have gone underground. Have you seen what's happening in Afghanistan? Uh, yes. 
Now ISIS has moved in. First, they, they were not talking to each other. They didn't like each other. Now they are together. Chechnya, Russia is going to suffer. China, the Uzmen, are going to... So, so the diffusion of ISIS doesn't mean we have won the war. Unless the world, America and everybody decide who is a terrorist. Let's fight the terrorists with one fist. If we don't, and we are looking, oh, these people, they are against the Russians, so let me help them. These people, they are against the Chinese, so let me help them. Or oh, these people, they are against the Americans, so let me help them. We will never win the war on terror. That's my take on it. You said that was the last question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.